Hey, welcome to this week's Home Experience Talk. Uh, my name is Pastor Greg Fralick, and uh, this is the Difference Church. We are a mobile church, and uh, it's been an exciting couple of years as we've kind of built the foundation of followers of Jesus who are now participating with us as we go out into the world to represent Christ, right? The ambassadors of Christ. We meet in our homes every week and we'll be meeting uh, on Easter out at the beach on Honeymoon Island. I hope you'll join us there. Well, I, uh, you know, I know I offended some people last week. That wasn't my intention. And I think it's okay, right? I think there's times where I get offended by things that God shows me. And I want you to, I want you to Take a pause, I want you to go back, and I want to remind you why we talked about the things we talked about last week, because we gotta keep the main thing, the main thing. And oftentimes, one of the enemy's uh, tools or the things he uses against us is to distract us from the main purpose. And we're gonna go all the way back to Matthew chapter 22, when Jesus says to the Pharisees, the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the things we should be focusing on. Our relationship with Christ first, and then our relationship with other people. And so some of these things that we get enamored with at times can distract us if we're not careful. If we're just looking for the God hit over and over, if we're looking for something else, to replace our involvement in someone's life, then we got to look at it. But we can use those things as tools to walk with others, but we got to be involved in their life. So if you missed that, go watch that, go through the questions, do a little self-reflection and make sure that you're staying true to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Well, this week I am uh, going to be talking about uh, this word we call hate. And the title of this message is something along the lines of stop trying to get the world to love you. Um, I think that is a, a human condition that we have to fight against. Let's go back to uh, our grade school days when you're at the playground and uh, they're picking teams for kickball or for some contest or something. No one wants to be the last one picked, right? We want to be accepted. And as you get a little older and into middle school, and then as you get into high school, you start wanting to be more accepted. We start wanting to hang around more of the popular kids. We want to do things that are considered cool. And so we'll compromise ourselves and we'll compromise our morals in order to fit in. Well, guess what, y'all? We do the same thing as Christians oftentimes, and I just want to go back to some things that Jesus said so that we can remind ourselves to stay pure in the mission and not get swayed because of the opinion of others. Here's a couple of scripture verses I want to start with. First of all, this is Jesus talking in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He says this, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Stop there for a second. Jesus is telling his followers, look, you're going to encounter this hatred, but just remember, they hated me first and you think I'm pretty good, right? You know I'm the Messiah, so if it hates me, um, it's okay for them to hate you as well. I have a purpose. I have a plan. And then he goes on to say, if you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. See, God has reserved you as his very own. He has chosen you as a special person to follow him and to be loved by him, to be one of his beloved children. Let's continue on. More words from Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Going back to my friend Max's uh, message on persecution, and he said in that talk, man, you know, you today you can talk about spirituality and God and all that, but as soon as you mention the name of Jesus, that's where everything starts going, like hatred starts coming in. Why is that? 
Because the enemy knows that Jesus is the one that conquered sin and death. The two things that he would hold over our heads has been conquered by Jesus. And so, of course, they're going to hate Jesus because he is now an enemy. I'm going to go to John 3.19. Jesus again. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Listen, obviously, if somebody's living opposed to God and God is trying to point out their faults, they're not going to want to hear it. They prefer darkness. You know, if you've never read the book of James, man, James does not play. He says it straight up, like hits you between the eyes. Listen to this in James chapter four, verse four. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. This is a, a principle that we have to understand in our own life that is going to just simply be true. Uh, it reminds me of a quote from A.W. Tozer. He's a, a famous author, and he said that to be right with God has often meant that you were going to be in trouble with men or with others, right? Following God is going to have its consequences. So if that's true, then what are we worried about? Why are we trying to win the world over? And that brings me to something called cancel culture. This is one of the tools, this is the way the enemy works. I'm trying to point these things out so you don't fall for these things. You don't lose your, your zeal for the Lord. You don't lose your power and authority in, in the kingdom of God, right? Bringing the kingdom of God here. Well, cancel culture. What is cancel culture? I'm sure you've all heard of it. Uh, it's, there's actually a definition for it. This is what I wrote down. Cancel culture is a phenomenon in which those who are deemed to have acted or spoken in an unacceptable manner are ostracized, boycotted, or shunned. Okay, so the whole idea of cancel culture is that now that we have all this social media, everybody has a voice. So if, for example, if I'm against God and I don't like the light, then if the if the people of God are espousing a certain way of living that I don't like, I'm going to organize, even though I'm a small group, but I'm going to organize together and my voice is going to be louder because I'm going to start saying things against your group that's going to make you sound like someone who's a hate monger. So what happens is they've shifted the whole principle of how God created things from the beginning. Let me, let me dive a little deeper for you to help you to understand this, okay? Tolerance has become the new love, right? It used to be that love was this concept where you would do something for someone, you would love them, you would care for them, no matter what, you would show affection in a way that um, was genuine. And hatred was when you um, wanted someone's demise, right? You, did, you wanted them to, to, uh, to not have success and, and to love them as you, you, you cared for them. You wanted them to be successful. Well, now it's not about that anymore. It's about tolerance. It's become the new love. What does that mean? It means that in order, like the, the, the measurement that people are going to say you have love in your heart is how tolerant you are to someone else. And on the flip side of that, how much hatred you have, what a hate monger, and I can slap this label on you, is how intolerant you are. So what happens? Well, they take the behaviors that they want to espouse, this small group, and it's opposed to maybe even a larger group's belief on how we should live our life. But in the interest of tolerance, I'm going to say that you are a hate monger because you won't tolerate the behaviors that I'm doing. See, that's become the new definition of love. And this is how smaller groups 
are canceling larger groups. Well, what's the response supposed to be from us as Christians? Well, number one, we can't give in to cancel culture. Like, if I'm concerned about espousing the things of God, then I'm caring more about what man thinks than what God thinks. I, I can't do that. I have to be true to who I am. Additionally, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then I'm guessing at one point of your life, you were living opposed to God. You weren't living your life uh, as a, a pure person following doing the things of God. You were doing things in your own life. And how did it what, it, what did it result in? Well, it resulted in guilt and shame. It resulted really in death of your soul, of your spirit. You were not alive. But when you were made alive by Christ through his resurrection, he resurrected you from that place of shame and guilt and sin. He brought you into new life and you received forgiveness and now a gift of eternal life. You now know it. This life is so much better to live. So how can we say that it's more loving to let people go down a path that we know leads to destruction? Now, don't make the mistake. I don't believe that we as Christians are supposed to be pointing fingers to everybody that you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, and, and, and look for these conflicts. Not at all. What we're supposed to do, and we talked about this last week, it's why this message last week was so important, is because we are supposed to pay attention to the assignments, to the workers that God is bringing into our path. It's great, our, our small group uh, met and we, we, we had a great conversation about, and, and we prayed for workers. We prayed for God to bring people into our path. And then the very next day we had our group, this lady, she, she shared a, a message with our entire group about how God literally had a divine appointment for her the very next day, right after she prayed for God to bring the workers. See, that's the way it works. And, but if that person is seeking um, love from you, you got to love them. You got to walk with them. You got to care for them. But then when they... When they ask you the truth about something, you can't hedge your bed and be like, eh, I don't know, I don't really wanna talk about that. You gotta point them to the word of God. You gotta point them to the truth of the way God says he's, we're supposed to live our lives. And why? Because I'm gonna tell you that it's much more loving to tell people the truth because you know it leads to restoration and life in, in love in their life than to allow them to go through this destructive path. Listen, I'm telling you, those of you that are a little bit older, the young people in our country today are desperate for you to tell them the truth. They can handle it, but they need it done in a loving, authentic way. See, that's not hatred to, to tell them the path, to tell them the right way. Listen, they can choose what they want. I'm not supposed to judge that. If somebody chooses to live their life a certain way, that's between them and God. But as soon as it rubs up against me, man, I'm supposed to be the light. I have to tell them the truth about how God says we're supposed to be a part of his family, to be a child of God. The problem is we're so stubborn as people. The Israelites were often called a stiff-necked people. And there's this example where uh, Stephen is meeting with uh, these religious leaders. He's telling them all about Jesus and they're rejecting him. They're hating him, just like Jesus said was gonna happen. And this is what he says to him in Acts chapter seven, verse 51. Man, you gotta love Stephen. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. See, I believe that uh, we're going to come against this accusation of being a hate monger. But see, no one can really say that about me because I live my life from an attitude of love. I choose to follow Jesus, receive his love, and then I choose to love others first. I'm not leading with truth. I'm not pointing out your faults before I get involved in your life. I'm walking with you and then as the Lord leads me, as the Holy Spirit prompts me now, I'm willing to talk about these things. I do think there are some bigger issues that as, as the body of Christ, 
We've got to stand up for that our culture is saying, no, you can't say these things, you can't do these things. And that's where my heart gets hurt because I think so much of, of uh, churches in America, they avoid that. And I think the reason why they avoid that is they don't want to offend people because it hurts the business model. Look, I'm, I'm just telling you how it is, right? As soon as you attach a bunch of money to something, then you kind of got to you know, compromise your morals a little bit. Well, we shouldn't be compromising our moral. And it's sad to me that we can't even say, we can't even define what a man is. We can't define what a woman is. And if you can't do that, how are you going to know that God designed marriage for a specific purpose between a man and a woman? Come on, guys. That's not rocket science. That's not, that's, that's, that's well long established um, a theology in the church. And it's not only theology, it is, it is God's design for our lives. We more glorify God by the way we, the way a husband sacrifices his life, gives up his life for his wife, and how a wife sacrifices and gives up her life for her husband. It is a beautiful picture because God gave you one person that you had to make a choice to love unconditionally. You have to choose to do that though, okay? But out of that choice, God then gives you children that you don't have to choose to love them. You automatically love them. It's a gift given by God above. We can't be afraid of those that would call us names or cancel us or blah, 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 blah. We simply have to live our lives as authentic followers of Christ. This is why I don't think we have to try and win the world over or we got to make Christianity look cool by, by watering things down. No. To me, Jesus stands on his own. I know that if you follow Jesus, it's going to result in a great life for you. Oh, you'll have your twists and turns. Everything's not perfect, but it will be the adventure of your life. And at the end of your life, you'll look back and go, man, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't change a thing. And you're now living in this place of purity. You have the righteousness of Christ. And then one day to be reunited with the, your Father in heaven because of the work of Jesus and to live with the Holy Spirit in your life, there's nothing better. Jesus tells a story about uh, this Good Samaritan story where uh, there was three people going by, a guy that was robbed and beaten and and he says there was a priest so he's supposed to be a man of God and he stays on the other side of the road and leaves the man to suffer and die and then a Levite this would be a guy that was like raised to understand the law of God and he doesn't stop and help but this Samaritan guy remember Samaritans were looked upon as like the lowest of the lows in society he comes and he and he cares for this person and he and he bandages him up and he brings him to an inn and he pays the bill for me and says, man, make sure this, this person is nursed back to health. Well, Jesus tells us that story because so many times that we aren't willing to get involved in the difficult things because we're afraid. We're afraid of cancel culture. We're afraid of being called intolerant. We're afraid of what people might think about us. Listen, if you already know because Jesus told you the world's going to hate you anyways, you might as well just, and Jesus said, look, I was first. They hated me, so if they hate you, it's got to be good, right? That's okay. They, they can hate me. I'm not going to hate them back, but I'm not going to compromise the way Jesus is telling me to live my life and the way I'm supposed to represent him. I'm going to end in, uh, with a verse, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I just want you to read this with me because, man, this is, this is going to speak to somebody. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same resolve, because anyone who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Consequently, he does not live out his remaining time on earth for human passions, but for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past carrying out the same desires as the Gentiles, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Because of this, they consider it strange of you not to plunge with them into the same flood of reckless indiscretion and they heap abuse on you. 
You guys, next week we're going to talk about what it means to be holy. It might not be next week. It might be in a, in a week or two to come. But we're going we're to talk about what it means to be holy. This is what I'm talking about, that you are called by God to be set apart and that the world is naturally going to hate you because you stand for the light. And you got to understand that there are people living in the darkness. And some of those people in the darkness, God is working on to bring them into the light and you become the very agent of that work. That's why we prayed last week, to bring the workers. Don't stop that. God will use you, bring people into your path. You will have very close friendships, relationships that are that will be developed by people that were in a broken place. You loved them and you spoke truth to them and then God brought them into restoration with him. So I close our time in prayer. Just bow your head and just receive this into your own heart. Lord, it's hard to hear that we're going to be hated. None of us want to be hated. But ultimately, the thing we want the most is to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And those are the words that come from you. And that's the only thing that really matters. We're not going to be afraid of people that would threaten to hate us or threaten to cancel us or call us intolerant and that kind of thing. Lord, give us deep grace, deep mercy, deep care for others so that we can love them. We can walk with them even as they're living opposed to you. But then God, do as only your Holy Spirit can do and convict their heart. Start to reveal truth to them that they can walk in the way of Jesus and find healing, restoration, freedom, love, joy, hope, all of those things, they could find that in their own life and then become a representative for you. This is how you're building the kingdom. This is what you started when you came to this earth. You're a, a, a ministry of reconciliation. God, I pray for each person that's watching this right now, that they would have peace, they would allow their, their heart to just settle and receive all that you have for them today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the time with your groups and uh, looking forward to Easter Sunday on the beach at Honeymoon Island.